Yes, today I want to talk a bit about how Romans got themselves clean and sweet smelling and then I'll move on to the actual makeup in the following week's session. And if you're going to look at how you're going to keep yourself clean, you have to start at the very beginning. I have props today. You have to start with one of these, which, as you'll probably be aware, is a spongier, a sponge, a sponge on a stick, proper uh, natural sea sponge on a stick, which, of course, is your Roman toilet paper, particularly if you're in a city rather than anywhere where you can just get hold of moss from the nearest uh, bit of wilderness, because that's obviously free and easy and you don't have to worry about it afterwards. Whereas, of course, with your spongier, you have to decide either you're going to carry around your own wherever you go, or you're going to have to use the one that's provided for you in the bathhouse where it is stuck in some vinegar, um, gone off red wine to await the use by the next person. Carrying your own is probably slightly less grim, but either way, it's not the best of looks, is it? But, you know, very useful thing. And of course, the uh, Roman toilets have survived in, in great number. Um, the sort of stone circle at the top and keyhole shaped bit underneath it so you can reach in with your spongia for exactly that purpose. There have also been um, uh, chamber pots found in the homes of the rich and indeed we know that the chamber pots of people like emperors are sometimes gold and then of course it's uh, you don't need a flowing water thing underneath it because you can do perfectly well getting your servant to tip it. And one of the places you'll find these multi-seat toilets, of course, is in the bathhouse. And that's the main place people are going to go in order to get clean. It's hard to know how often because it's going to vary a lot for different people. But we know that, that there's some evidence that most people would try and have a good bath um, once a week. And uh, if they could manage it more often than that, then they probably would. Um, Seneca says once a week is sort of normal. Um, but of course, most people have to go to the public ones. And even if you have got a private one at home, you're still going to choose to go to the public one quite regularly because it has a lot of functions, including social functions. It's a place where you can meet and talk with a wider range of people than would normally be uh, considered acceptable in polite society. And they can provide a wider range of services, perhaps, than you can get at home. We know that... Um, for instance, minor surgeries are often carried out in bathhouses. Little, um, the handles of surgical equipment has been found clogging up the drains. More often clogging up, uh, clogging up the drains, you get um, hairpins where ladies have taken out all their pins to wash the hair and then not been able to find them all to put them back again. And a posh bathhouse could be very fancy indeed. A posh bathhouse is going to have um, the biggest mirrors they can manage, polished bronze mirrors, they're going to have silver taps, they're going to have mosaic floors, they're going to give you white fluffy towels and sponges and wooden soled bath uh, bathing shoes so that you don't slip on the wet marble and it's going to be quite a lot like a, a modern spa in some respects. Usually it's mixed although occasionally there are particular days or particular sections that are women only and generally you're going to be cleaning yourself with oil and with a whole range of herbs that you put in the oil and because the romans are so much like us in terms of wanting their conspicuous consumption both the nature of the oil and the nature of the herbs and things in it is going to be the best you can afford and the best you can show off that you can afford so you could just have you know a bit of olive oil and nothing else or you could have very fancy oils from foreign countries and of course you have your strigil also my prop, which is absolutely perfect for put all that oil on and then just scrape it back off again. Um, and I have actually tried this and it, it does work. You know, you steam yourself, then all of the, the sweat, all of your dirt comes up in your sweat. You scrape it off and you're sorted. Um, there would be a specialist person to do this. Often you'd get um, a child. You have the job of being a bathhouse slave and spend your day scraping stuff off the people's backs but the thing is there's a way of getting a good little sideline if you do that because this resulting mix of the oil the sweat the dead skin the dirt um, is called strigumentum and it's valuable Pliny the elder says that only a sm even a small amount of gladiator strigumentum 
can sell for 80,000 sesterces. That's like hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, we know that Galen recommends it for aches and, sp aches and sprains, but there is a persistent rumour that it is also used by women and particularly by um, sort of senators' wives, given that it is a very expensive thing, as a face cream or as an aphrodisiac. And of course, there is a little bit of sense in that because logically the sweat of gladiators is going to have a lot of testosterone in it. And potentially, you know, that could rejuvenate your skin or potentially that could act as an aphrodisiac. Hormonal chemistry being the complicated thing that it is, there might be something to that. But your average person's um, strigimentum isn't going to be worth a lot. Your gladiators are obviously the uh, the great stars of the day. And uh, if the if the senator's wife can't help herself to a gladiator, which they also did that, the next best thing is to rub themselves in his sweat, apparently. There you go. Um, other things you can do to get clean in your bathhouse, uh, you can use a pumice stone on a, a handle, uh, you can use soapwort extract, you can use a mixture with flour and crushed, very it's hard to say that, crushed, <laughs> crushed snail shell, I'll try that, crushed, crushed snail shell, um, which obviously is an exfoliant, and Generally, you'd do it in two stages. You'd do something quite harsh to your skin. You might even use Natron, which is a soda-based detergent and is very hard. And you'd use that, and then you'd put the moisture back in with a moisturiser. Because you're old. Um, soap is a weird one. Generally speaking, there aren't any recipes that have actual soap in. And that's possibly the reason why they go down this whole route of using um, oils to get the dirt off your skin in the first place. On the other hand, the story is that the word soap comes from... Sapo, which is a mountain in Italy, um, and certainly the chemical ingredient, the same thing you find in soap wort, is called saponin. Um, and uh, the, the theory is that soap was discovered because this is a site where animals get sacrificed and the rainwater uh, washes down through that and there's wood ash uh, from the fires in the process. And if you combine your water and your wood ash and your um, animal fat in the right quantity, potentially you can get soap. And this sort of washed down the Tiber and then people further down the Tiber found there was this, you know, weird suds on their water, which they could use for cleaning things. But that's not necessarily true. That's one theory of the time. Pliny the Elder says that soap was invented by the Gauls for giving a reddish tint to their hair. And that's possibly if you have too high a proportion of lye in what you're doing, you end up with something that bleaches. So if, it, then if it's bleaching dark hair, you might get a, a red in your hair. Um, and he gives a recipe for making some that he says is for using to disperse scrofulous sores. I think they definitely haven't worked out the right balance of the ingredients that are needed to make a workable soap. They just might sometimes have a workable soap by accident. Other things. Romans care a lot about looking uh, clean and smelling clean and all of these elements. And one of the things they do about that is it's very common for them to carry a chatelaine around, which is a, a little set of implements that you keep on a ring, on your belt or, or in a pouch. And they commonly have um, tweezers, an ear scoop or a scapulum, um, which is just a, a little tiny, tiny spoon on a stick. Um, they often have a nail cleaner. Sometimes they have a toothpick, although you can also use uh, bird quills as toothpicks. Sometimes a cosmetic brush. And this is both men and women carry these things. It's like maybe the co cosmetic brush. Um, there are other alternatives for some of these things. And again, I've got one for demo purposes, which is this beautiful little fella here, um, who is a copy of a Romano Egyptian um, implement. And he's obviously some sort of ibis or equivalent Egyptian bird. And the theory is that this side of him is a uh, toothpick. No, other way around. This side is a nail cleaner and that side is a toothpick, which, of course, also harkens to the various kinds of birds that click away at the teeth of crocodiles and hippos and so on. The idea that uh, a, you could get a bird to pick your teeth for you. So here is a little one to do just that. Another part of it is you have to smell good and they are it's, it's part of being respectable not is not being just smelly and they did have deodorant they have um 
they, they know that alum powder rubbed under the armpits will keep you smelling good and again that is true alum turns up in a lot of modern ones and if you've ever seen these cosmetic um, crystal sticks they're basically alum sticks sometimes and that works very well they would also if they've got down to the dregs of their perfume they would rub that um, under their armpits which isn't going to work as well but at least it's uh, it's a bit of an alternative their idea of beauty involves having flawless skin generally pale skin if you are female because that shows you don't have to go out and work and obviously the most respectable of women barely leave the house apart from to go to you know dinner parties men are allowed to get a tan and actually in some bathhouses you can find places with uh, big sort of archways and seats underneath where the men could sunbathe in a row um, but it would be very very weird for a woman to do that because they were supposed to have this pale skin is described as white or dazzling or glowing terms like that and obviously some of that's going to be cosmetic and we'll come to that later but you are also going to want to use various face products which are going to make your skin you know smooth and blemish free and moisturized and toned and all of the same exactly the same things that we have now roman uh, approaches to beauty therapy are very similar to us in terms of what they're aiming for it's just the actual ingredients get really, really weird. Some of them are sensible. You know, you, you can't go wrong with a cleanser made of lanolin and honey or a softener with almond milk and honey and uh, uh, broad bean flour or you know, a, a night pack of flour, a night face pack of flour and ass's milk. Ass's milk has a lot of lactic acid in it, which is good as a skin peel. And that's why you know, Cleopatra is bathing in the stuff. It, it really does um, act as a, a, a very slight skin peel. Um, the one that I um, make sometimes and use sometimes is a Galenic recipe for a um, very rich moisturiser that's made basically from beeswax and rose water and is very, very good for you and was used for a long time afterwards. That's the good ones. But much more fun is to think about the bad ones and the ones that make no sense to us. So let's start on that. And again, these come from lots of different places. All the, you can't go wrong with a bit of Pliny for this because he likes his animal ingredients. So for instance, if you want to know a good use for lion fat, Pliny says a mix of lion fat and rose oil is very good for a fair complexion and against spots. And handily, you can use exactly the same recipe for frostbite and swollen joints. So all purpose, very useful stuff. If your problem, however, is not spots, but wrinkles, Pliny says the best thing to do involves swan fat and ass's milk. Again, ass's milk good, swan fat, I mean, it's going to work, but why does it have to be swan? Well, if you ask Pliny, he says it doesn't have to be swan. Bear will do just as well if you can't get any swan. In what world getting hold of bear is easier than getting a hold of swan? I don't know. Um, he also says that if you burn snails to get snail ash, that's very good for freckles. My favourite one of all of these comes from uh, Dioscorides and he says that uh, people who, women who could do with more colour in their cheeks, because obviously you're supposed to be pale, but you're also supposed to have nice little rosy cheeks, should seek out crocodile dung and powder it and take the smallest lumps first because they'll be the easiest to powder. Powder the whole thing down and mix in alcohol and put it all over your face. Now, there is a demand for crocodile dung. Remember, it's also used at this point as a contraceptive method, which, I mean, we put off a lot of people. We a lot fewer babies for that reason, if nothing else. Um, but of course, you can't find free Roman crocodiles all the way around the Roman Empire. But there is that demand, which means it's expensive anywhere else in the empire. And if it's expensive, someone's going to find a way to fill that market. And in this case, Dioscorides says what some cunning souls have done is they've got hold of some starlings fed them on a diet of rice and their guano, their droppings, looks, when it's dried and powdered, very much like crocodile dung. So all you need to do is keep yourself some starlings, feed them the right diet, take their dung, and those gullible rich ladies will not know the difference, and then you can just sell them some crocodile dung, in, some, some fake crocodile dung instead. Bird guano is also considered to be good in Ovid's After Beauty, the froth on which the Halcyon builds her floating nest. Now, Halcyon is a kingfisher, and the froth which is used to hold the nest together is, of course, droppings. 
and this is used in lupin seed oil to clear the face of its freckles. The funny thing is, those people sell it who bought the knockoff stuff might get a better effect out of it than the people who bought the real stuff, because real crocodile dung isn't going to do that much, whereas guano, bird droppings, contains guanine, which is an enzyme which you can still get in modern face creams. They usually make it out of fish scales these days, but if you pay enough money, and uh, the one person I know who has done this because it was in all the newspapers at the time is Posh Spice, you pay enough money, you can still get a facial which is genuinely made from nightingale droppings. So that has to be one of the sillier ideas, possibly tying with the rubbing gladiator sweat in your skin. Um, one of the things you're going to try and do is, is spend as much money as you possibly can, of course, on doing this. Cleopatra once spent 400 denarii on a single pound of moisturiser, which contained uh, kifi, which is this mix of lots of different um, resins and spices, which is very, very expensive. Plutarch said that it was so calming and soothing that the sorrows and tensions of daily anxieties are loosened and untied like tangled knots. On the other hand, I suspect Cleopatra probably had a very good masser anyway, so pretty much any oil would probably have had that effect. Now, a lot of these, of course, are, are really greasy. They're, they're all very oil-based. Juvenal says that Poppea, who's Nero's wife, had a whole range of beauty products named for her. Um, so she, she had her own range. Nothing's new under the sun. Poppea had her own range of, of uh, cleanser products that she was probably getting some money on. Juvenile calls them, calls them the Punguia Poppeana, which translates as the Poppean greasy things. So buy your, your range of Poppean grease right here. Whether or not she invented those, not sure. She definitely did invent Tectorium, which is a particular face cream. Um, well, the, the word is used either for the face cream that Poppea invented and for stucco wall uh, decoration. So that gives you some idea what kind of texture it was, at least. It was something that you might put on your face. And of course, once you've got all that oil in there, you're going to need to uh, scrub at least some of it off. So there are a lot of face scrubs going around with sort of crushed seeds and uh, crushed uh, pits of different things in there. Another problem you may face if you are trying to pass in polite Roman society is that you have too much body hair. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are going to have this problem because they thought that you know we, we should all naturally have rather less some thought that the ideal woman would only have hair on her head and nowhere else at all more often you'd settle for not having it on your armpits and your legs um so ovid in the art of love says to women you should see that your legs are not rough with bristles and do not let a rude goat inhabit your armpits important life lesson right there most of these people would also argue that men should leave their legs alone, but that men should also have smooth armpits. And there is a slave job, the Apulus, whose, whose job is to remove unwanted hair. But there's various approaches to doing this. Seneca writes a letter complaining about um, the sound he can hear because he's lodging above a bathhouse. And while he's there, he writes this letter saying, imagine the hair plucker, the, the Apulus. Alipillus, always get that one, the Alipillus. Uh, imagine the hair plucker with his penetrating shrill voice, never holding his tongue except when he is plucking the armpits and making his victim yell instead. So you've either got the sound of the Alipillus playing his trade, or you have the sound of the per person he's making scream by individually plucking out their armpit hairs, which, yeah, that's, that's you're going to make a noise, aren't you? There are other approaches uh, which aren't necessarily any better. You could use, uh, you could heat up something like wal uh, a powder made from grinding up walnuts and mixing that with pitch. You could use resins and you could use arsenic and quicklime or caustic orpiment earth, which are all very strong alkalis. And with those, it's a case of you put them on and then you just hope that you time it exactly right, that they're going to burn through the hair slightly quicker than they're going to burn through your skin. Um, I think if I was stuck back in that era, I would settle for trying to do it all with a pumice stone. That seems like it's probably a bit less unpleasant than any of the other options. 
you might think that you don't have enough hair in various places. Eyebrow fashion changes. We think this is a modern thing, the obsession with uh, getting your eyebrows perfect one way or another, but no, no, no. There are certain points in Roman uh, era when you should have either no eyebrows or next to no eyebrows or perfectly natural ones, or even a monobrow. That is at one point fashionable in Rome. And uh, in order to do that, we know that they use soot to darken their eyebrows, and there is even some evidence that they use fakes to do it, probably some sort of fur. The suggestion is it might be mouse fur, because we know that's used further on in history. We don't know for sure, but that seems the most likely thing that would provide fine enough fur to actually make your own monobrow that you'd stick on. There are also ways to restore hair. Um, According to Galen, Cleopatra's own recipe to restore your hair involved realgar paste, which is arsenic monosulfide, which just sounds like a bad idea from the name alone, doesn't it? Uh, mixed with oak gum. Another bit of you that you're going to want to keep clean is your teeth. And there are various ways of doing this, but it's very important for your social standing that you do. Ovid says you can let you can do yourself untold damage when you laugh if your teeth are black or too long or too irregular. Do not let your teeth turn black through laziness, but wash out your mouth every morning. Of course, compared to us, that kind of dental decay isn't going to be the big problem anyway, because they have a relatively low sugar diet. So at least they've got that on their side. In Pompeii, apparently, the researchers have found that most of the um, corpses have perfect sets of teeth. Nonetheless, they do still try and maintain that. And common things they might do, um, soda and bicarbonate. Well, you can still buy, Arm & Hammer is still made with uh, bicarbonate soda. Uh, pumice stone powder, rather less good, bit too abrasive, I'd have thought. There are several accounts that say that uh, urine was regularly used for the cleaning of teeth. Catullus uh, writes, uh, has a poem called Ignatius of the White Teeth, which is about his own lawyer. And he says that his lawyer's bright smile is because he has Spanish, Celtiberian heritage, and that in Celtiberia, whatever each man has urinated, with this he is accustomed in the morning to rub his teeth and gums until they are red. So that the more polished those teeth of yours are, the more urine they proclaim you to have drunk. I don't think he liked his lawyer very much by the sound of that, but um, yeah, this led to um, some sites you'll see now say that um, Spanish urine was thought to be particularly good. I'm not sure that's true. I think it's more that um, people in Spain were the ones who did this. I have no idea if that would have worked. Not planning to find out anytime soon. We can look at um, the recipes given by Scribonius Largus, who gives three recipes for toothpaste. Um, and the general principle in, is, is a salt and soot thing, which you know, until relatively recently, salt and soot was one of the things that people would substitute when toothpaste was not available or was uh, expensive. So, but again, it's the Romans, so they can't just use any old soot. What that soot is made from has to be as expensive as possible, um, or at least stick different things in it. So one of these recipes involves barley flour with vinegar and with honey, um, and then mix in with rock salt until the whole thing turns to charcoal grind them, mix in enough spikenard to give an odour, and then Augustus's sister Octavia used this recipe. Celebrity endorsement right there. Um, the second one of his recipes is uh, very complicated. It includes sun-dried radish rind and finely ground glass or mica. I mean, I'm hoping for mica compared to glass, but either way, it's not really a great thing to be sticking on your gums, I wouldn't have thought. And the third one involves uh, burning up deer antlers to ash and then mixing that with sal ammoniac, which is um, smelling salts. Um, so again, you really do not want to go eating smelling salts. Um, possibly the one I would choose if I had to, again, take any of these recipes. So bicarbonate soda is not too bad. Um, there is one from a fourth century papyrus that involves um, salt, mint, pepper and iris flower or oris. And, you know, the salt's a bit abrasive, the mint's going to freshen your breath. And oris has been proven to have positive effects on um, against gum disease. So all in all, that one's probably not a bad idea. 
or less sensibly, again, we go to Pliny for our ridiculous stuff. Pliny says that you, um, you take the ashes of the head of a hare and donkey teeth and get all that down to, to charcoal and mix it with extracts of mouse brain. I, I don't know what's going on there. I mean, mice have good teeth. That kind of thinking did come into their, their thoughts occasionally, that sort of pattern, but I don't suppose do donkeys have particular, I mean, they have very dramatic teeth. I don't know. Basically, don't do anything just because Pliny tells you to. It's, it's recipe for trouble. You might just keep olive oil in your mouth to keep your teeth white. Again, I don't really see that working, but um, the other thing you might do is just want to freshen your breath. And you could do that by chewing laurel leaves or um, chewing, uh, swilling around some cinnamon. Or you could actually buy fresh breath tablets. So this is why I love the Romans. They're just like us and also completely bonkers. And we know about things like fresh breath tablets from one of Marshall's epigrams. Now, Marshall is really sarcastic to everyone about everything, pretty much. But in, in this case, he says, um, to avoid stinking too much of the wine you drank last night, Fresenia, Gorge yourself on the tablets from Cosmo's perfumery. These preparations plaster the teeth, but they are no use when a belch rises from the depths. Which uh, is fair comment about fresh breath tablets, really, isn't it? So you now are bathed and scrubbed. You have on your, uh, your best deodorant and you have cleaned your teeth and you have i uh, got the right amount of hair, you've put on your your mouse fur eyebrows and then got your mouse brain and made a use for that as well. Maybe it's just it's, it's just about efficient use of mice, right? And that's us for today. And then next week we will add the makeup and the perfume and the wig. And then you'll be ready to go out to your grand Roman uh, ball, except of course we're not allowed to do stuff like that anymore. Probably for good reason, given some of the stuff that they would eat probably includes bat. So there you go. And on that note, I shall bid you all 